Steve, what was it like as a longtime Boston area guy to become an owner of the Celtics? You know, it, it was really unbelievable. Uh, I followed the team you know, my entire life, and uh, basketball is a huge part of my family, and, and uh, to have this opportunity, it's just been amazing. When you came in, was there any sort of reluctance on your part, knowing that it was going to be a group where there were going to be multiple owners and, you know, some potential conflicts in terms of how decision making was it going to be, or did you feel that it was going to be pretty smooth given who the investors were going to be? Well, we didn't know the investors, but I, I'm part of a partnership, and you know, I think partnerships really work, and you can construct great partnerships. And we started out from the beginning to get investors that loved basketball. You know, our objective, you know, was to really win a championship. You know, as Wick would say, we're not here for 70% IRR. We're here to win a championship. Banner 17. That was the name of the company. So we made it very clear, and, and when the investors understood that. So we have a passionate group of investors that are fans, probably fans first and investors second. As, fa as fans first, what was your appraisal of the team when you bought it? Well, the team was, you know, it had won in, I think, 16 years. And Boston is, as you know, being from New York, is called Championship Town. And uh, you've got to win a championship for the fans here. So we were nervous about that. It was a decent team. But it wasn't a team that could contend for the NBA title. And our plan was to try to get a title in five years was our business plan. Were they trying to figure out, like, who you guys were and what your backgrounds were? They were. Uh, you, you know, they, they, they termed us as venture capitalists, you know, which I think is, is a good thing. Uh, but uh, they said, I think the headline was venture capitalists, you know, buy sports team. And I think the big worry was, would venture capitalists somehow, uh, you know, try to milk the team for cash flow and run it in, in a different way than it had been run? And we were quite the opposite. We were going to put money into the team and try to win a championship. Did you spend considerable amount of time explaining that to them and saying, look, you know, we're basketball fans first and this is how we plan to run the team? We did, but, you know, the, as you know, the, the press is very skeptical at times. And, and uh, uh, I think what it took was them watching what we did. And, you know, the first thing we did was invest in more technology. We had, we had a business plan that required three things. One, we wanted to build a championship team and do all the things to do that, which meant uh, hiring a GM, beefing up our scouting, beefing up our technology and stat capabilities, just, just really beefing every, our travel, uh, going to foreign countries to look at players the previous regime had not spent a lot of time, you know, traveling around looking, scouring the earth for players. The second piece was to be a big impact in the community. You know, we formed something called the Boston Celtic Shamrock Foundation, and we wanted to get our players and ourselves out of the community, raising money, helping children in Boston here. And the third piece was the garden, you know, needed more amenities. So we didn't have cheerleaders. We were the only team in the NBA that had no cheerleaders. It took us a while to get those. Uh, there's a funny story with Red Arback. Red Arback was not a big fan of cheerleaders. So it took us five years to convince Red. But, but the, the third thing was to really improve the amenities, be more fan friendly, uh, do emails, uh, the Jumbotron up there, brand new Jumbotron, invest in that with the garden. And so those, that was the business plan. Why did you have to convince Red about the cheerleaders? Well, it's funny, the day after we announced we were buying the team, uh, and at that point I think it was Wick, Wick, myself, and his dad, Wick and I flew down to Washington, D.C. to bring Red Arbach back in the fold. And he sat uh, behind a desk in Washington. It's been his office since the 50s, and he hadn't changed anything since the 50s. So it was a rotary phone, literally. He had letter openers, you know, on the desk, and, and we came down, we were going to show him the business plan, and, and we said, you know, he said, I want to give you guys some advice. And, and we said, well, great, Red, what's the advice? He said, one thing, get players that are instigators, not retaliators. And my second piece of advice is never have cheerleaders. They're nothing but trouble. <laughs> so we put the plan back in the briefcase and <laughs> took a while to get cheerleaders. Why did you have to meet with Red? Was he still an owner in the team at that point? Red was an owner team, but you know, Red uh, was the founder, was the institution. And we felt it was important to bring back Red and bring back all the old players and recapture that tradition we had had for so many years here. So we made a real emphasis to you know, bring back John Havlicek and get all the, the former legends involved, Bill Russell, uh, and, and it, was, it was really a labor of love. In, in bringing back Celtic legends like John Havlicek and bringing back Red Auerbach and making him part of the process, did that, do you think, help convince the fan base, the sponsors, and the media that you guys were in this for the right reasons? I think so. Over time, what happened was as we invested in technology, we invested in more coaching, general manager, we brought in great people like Danny Ainge and Doc Rivers. Uh, they saw that we beefed up the scouting, we, 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 we drafted great players, we brought Red back in. I think people started to see that we were really here to try to win a championship. And uh, I really have to thank the fans because they, they did put skepticism aside. The media didn't, the fans certainly did, 
and they started to fill the garden. The, gar the, the tenants went up, it was around 16,000. As we started to make these moves, people had hope. Uh, we brought in young players like Al Jefferson, who became a star in the league. People had hope, and people started to fill up the garden. So the fans are great here. Arguably, Steve, Danny Ainge could have been your most important decision at that early stage. What convinced you that he was the right guy for the job? Well, I had known Danny Ainge personally for a long time. I had sat on the board of the Forever Young Foundation with Steve Young, and Danny was part of that board. So I'd known him, I think, for five or ten years before we bought the Celtics. So when Wick and I talked about how we're going to really upgrade the basketball situation, I said, well, let me call Danny and get some advice on who we should hire as a general manager. And at that time, he had a very lucrative broadcasting career. Uh, he was doing, uh, doing all the NBA games. So he happened to come town two weeks later, and I had dinner with him. That dinner went, it was after the Phoenix game. I remember that. In fact, we're playing Phoenix this week. It was after that game, and we had dinner from maybe 10 to 3 in the morning. We just talked basketball. And he gave me some names, and I said, I talked to Wick, and we'd call him back in a couple weeks. I flew out to see him and actually meet some potential GMs, and he picked me up at the airport, and he said, I've thought about this, and I think maybe I'm the man for the job. So we drove around the airport, and I called Wick, and, and within you know, three weeks, Danny had signed on to be the GM, and, and he's, he's fantastic. What we liked about Danny is he's done every facet of basketball, from being a star player to being a coach uh, to being in scouting uh, to being in broadcasting, knew the league, very strategic has a good business mind as well as a basketball mind. And so he, he was a perfect fit for what we were trying to accomplish. Not all players, and any, regardless of sport, are, are willing to go that extra mile to get involved with charities. Yet you mentioned the Shamrock charity. How did the players so quickly get on board with that? Well, I think, for, first of all, it's kind of creating a culture. Uh, and we had great leaders here and had great players. You know, people like uh, Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce have always been great in the community. And we just helped them do that more. And I think when they saw the owners, you know, pitching in and helping create this foundation and, uh, and a staff going to the community, they really jumped on. I just went to Children's Hospital, for example, in the Christmas holidays, and our players were just fantastic with those kids. So it's kind of built up over 10 years, and, and now we think we're one of the leading sports, you know, for charity foundations, you know, in the country. One of the other uh, sponsor programs that have become uh, outreaches of charity is with Reebok, the 3C program. How successful has that been? And, and, and is it something that you think you can extend with other sponsors? We do. You know, you know sponsors uh, uh, get a lot of brand building out of being associated with a championship organization like the Celtics, but also extending in the community. So, so, so we have a lot of programs where our sponsors of the team will also help with charitable events. Uh, they'll come and, and bring their staff and we'll paint a school, we'll put in technology centers, and we'll work that interactively with the players. So it's a great equation. It, it, it's kind of a virtuous circle. You get in the community, the community supports you, we support the community. And, and the sponsors love to be involved in that. You mentioned that uh, the media was very surprised when the announcement came that your group was buying the team. W was one of the reasons that it was sort of kept quiet because of the fact that uh, it was an unusual ownership structure for the Celtics. Part of it was owned by pa Paul Gaston and his family of half and then another half was publicly traded. Was it so that you know, people didn't come in and start buying the stock in anticipation that the I, price was going to be I think the public aspect up? had something to do with it and, the, and then Paul really wanted, wanted it to be a quiet sale. He didn't want to go through a media circus so, so he put a price on the table and said if we met that price you know, we, we could have the team. Was there any apprehension on your part about buying a team where you were going to be a tenant in a building owned by someone else? So in other words here you have, you know, Delaware North and the Jacobs family. They own the building as well as the Bruins. And you guys were coming in as a tenant. Was there apprehension that, you know, it's going to be difficult for us to increase revenue? No, we looked at the numbers and uh, we, we felt that was, it, we could negotiate an attractive lease. The economics of buildings are much better if multiple teams are using them. You know, you have to pay a lot to put these kinds of buildings up. Today, buildings are costing five, six hundred, sometimes seven hundred million dollars. So, so, so the most successful buildings are ones that have a hockey team, a basketball team, or two, or the Staples Center has two basketball teams and a hockey team. Uh, so, so there is a, a fair negotiation that can be done to make it work for everyone. And we, we have formed a fabulous partnership with the Jacobs and, and do things with sponsors and things on the floor. And you can see our Shamrock Foundation thing on, on, uh, over there. The Jumbotron has been a joint venture with them. So I think we've had a great relationship and it's been great for both of us. Were there any NBA teams that you looked at and said sort of like, this is a type of team we could benchmark and sort of model ourselves after? 
Well, you know, we've, we've looked at all the models out there and we did a specific effort to look statistically on, you know, how you build a great team. And it turns out it's not that much different from building a great business. Uh, my, my primary business is Bain Capital where we try to build great businesses. And the first thing is get great management. You know, the, second, the second thing is take a long-term view. Uh, the big mistakes owners have made, I believe, in the past is if you want to come in and fix a team immediately, uh, you'll go trade for an aging player, a player that's 38, 39 years old, might get you some ticket sales for one year, but that's not going to build the championship. You've got to build around drafting well and trading for young superstar talent. So we saw we had Paul Pierce here, and the original strategy was to draft uh, great players. Danny Ainge was fantastic at that, and then either grow them with Paul Pierce or trade them for more experienced players who were really star quality. That's how the, the, the Ray Allen trade came about, the Kevin Garnett trade came about. We got that big three. Danny supplemented, and, and that led us to a championship and a very competitive team today. It's so tough, though, to do that and make it work. I'm thinking, you know, Ray Allen and Kevin Garnett signed the year before you win your championship. You know, two of the key cornerstones coming into this season. You re-sign Kevin Garnett. You get criticized by some people for it, saying he's going to be 39 at the end of his contract. Ray Allen's gone. Where does that leave you guys? Well, I, I think you if, you, if you watched last night, we beat the Knicks, which is a very good team. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that leaves us in pretty good shape. Garnett is uh, scoring 15 points and 10 rebounds a game. You know, you know he, he's, uh, he's, been, he's in fantastic shape. Paul and himself keep themselves in fantastic shape. Uh, they've got a lot of miles left on them. And the beauty is Danny supplemented this with great young talent. Jarrett Sullinger is playing fantastic. He drafted him 21. There were some back issues. He, might, he originally was going to be a top five draft choice. He's playing like a top five draft choice right now. So Danny's built a team using that veteran skill and then built young players around them, and we're very competitive. As a venture capital guy from Bain, one of the things Bain's been very successful at is turning around troubled companies. Did you view the Celtics not necessarily as a troubled team, but as perhaps an underutilized or undervalued team when you came in and bought it? I think we really saw it as an, an, an underutilized asset. Uh, it had been run more like a family business. and we knew we had to put investment into the team. So the, the team was, was more profitable when we bought it than, than after we bought it because we put the profits back into scouting, technology, player development. Uh, we, we were spending multiples of what they were spending before in the hopes we'd get a championship that, that, that having a, a competitive team would fill the building up and, uh, and make us be a, a back on that same kind of track that the Celtics had, had in, the, in, the, in the late 70s and the 80s. What's been your feeling uh, in terms of the new collective bargaining agreement and, and how it's worked out? It's still early yet, and what type of impact it's going to have on the NBA in the years going forward? Well, it, it was a, it was a uh, you know, you hate to go into any kind of strike situation. You know, hockey's been through a couple of them. The NBA's been through a couple of them. Football's been through a couple of them. Um, so it was a tough process. But the owners wanted to put a product on, on the court that could be competitively balanced, that would be fair, that would be great for the fans. The players wanted a fair shake. I think nobody liked the deal, but, but that's the, the mark of probably what is a fair deal, uh, getting together in the middle. So this 50-50 partnership with the players, I think, is going to work well for everybody. It's going to make all of our teams viable, competitive, uh, and it's going to make them a lot of money because we can now focus on kind of growing the pie. If you look at the NBA, it's one of the few global sports. It's, they're going crazy in China for basketball. Europe already has a very well-developed league. We have European players, Chinese players here. So, so this game has a lot of room to grow. The NBA in general, and the Celtics in particular, are very strong brands outside of the United States and Europe, as you mentioned. How can you capitalize on that? Well, the NBA has done, David Stern's been a leader in, in kind of the internet technology and kind of the ubiquity of the NBA product. So I think he's been a visionary and, and uh, just an amazing commissioner way out ahead of all the trends. So they've built our organizations in Europe, in China. Uh, there are sponsors over there. We have, we have uh, foreign companies that sponsors as teams here. And then we go and play every year. So there's building momentum for the NBA product. I was shocked when we went to Istanbul this year. We played a game in Istanbul in, in preseason and we played a Turkish team, and the place was full, and I would say a third of the jerseys were Celtics jerseys in Istanbul. Then we went to Italy, Celtics jerseys everywhere. So where you capitalize on it is, is uh, video clips, uh, a television following, and then eventually I think there will be teams, this game will be a global game, there will be teams that are competing globally. What has surprised you the most about being an owner of the Celtics? You know, I, I, it's interesting when we were fans, uh, fans first, and I think then then owners second. 
so there's not a manual to prepare you to be an owner. <laughs> there's no manual. Uh, and I remember, I remember vividly, we went to one of the first playoff games, Wick and I went together, and we threw on, you know, some kind of Celtics jackets. And there, when we were driving back, uh, flying back from that game, we landed, and we heard on the radio, all oh, those Celtics owners, you know, they're buffoons, they're wearing Celtics gear. You, you know, we, we didn't look like owners. And, and, and so we, we learned, you know, that there is enormous, you know, media scrutiny. Uh, anything uh, that, that you do has, takes a heightened uh, you know, sense of interest. And, and that, that was surprising. Now, I think we've, we've, uh, we've now proven that we can win a championship and people know our hearts are in the right place. We weren't fake fans. We were fans. We loved the game. We love we loved being here. We love the players. And so I think it's all come together. But I would say that the biggest surprise is, is in this town, uh, people live and die by the sports teams, and the Celtics is, is, is one of those they live and die by. It wasn't a smooth road to the championship, though. The two years prior to the championship, you didn't make the playoffs. Uh, the arena was not being sold out. Uh, like it is today. At that point, did you start to have doubts about, you know, was my investment worth it or is my time worth it as, as an owner of this team? You know, w w you always have ups and downs in the sports world. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of like being in the stock market. There are good days and bad days. The key is to keep a long-term perspective. So we met every year and we assessed progress against our goals. And our goals were to not just be a mediocre team. If you want to be a mediocre team, you can overpay some marginal players and, you know, win 30 or 40 games, get in the playoffs. We wanted to get a championship. So that was going to take some pain. So we invested in young players. Young players, it's proven, do not win right away. You know, Oklahoma City has a fantastic all-star group of young players. They haven't won it yet. It takes a while. So I think the biggest thing that the, man, the ownership group did under the leadership of WIC is we assessed where we were going. We stayed on that track. So in the bad times when there were signs, fire Danny, fire Doc, and if there could have been, if you could fire owners, there'd be signs, fire the owners, when we lost, I think, 50 or 60 games uh, in one of the years. We stepped back and said, you know, you've got to ignore the media, you've got to ignore, uh, you know, the criticism, because we saw progress every year. Our younger players were playing fantastic. They were getting better. They were going to be good trade assets or work with Paul to win a championship. And, and so, so it, was, it was progressing. And I think the best thing uh, we did and the, the smartest thing we did was stick with Danny and Doc and stick with that plan not panic, take the long-term view, and that's paid off in a championship and contending today. Any of the experiences or things you've learned at Bain over the years, have they helped you as an owner of the Celtics? Oh, I think it's helped me in enormously, and I think it goes back to that, that at Bain you learn you can't take a day-to-day -day perspective. You know, there are going to be things, there are going to be bumps in the road. And so if you, if you have a bad sales month or a bad year, you don't fire the management team. You assess where you're at. If everybody's working hard, has a plan, doing a great job, you stick with them. So I think that long-term approach really comes from venture capital. You know, some venture capital investments take 10 years to come to fruition. And we knew this was not going to happen overnight. You cannot fix a basketball team overnight. It, this is not going to happen. Uh, that's, a, that's a big lesson. I think, secondly, getting close to the customer. Uh, all of our businesses, we do primary research on what the customers really want. We saw a real opportunity here in Boston with some of the most passionate fans, you know, in the world. Uh, we think the most passionate fans in America are in Boston. And if we gave them uh, a fan amenities, uh, a product that they liked, whether you win or lost, we greeted them at the games, we had players talk to the fans, we interacted with the fans, you know, that would build momentum and, and have, have us have a very valuable asset. And that's happened. What was it like when you first bought the team and started to meet the players? Well, did they have a particular type of reaction to you guys saying, oh, you know, here are venture capital guys coming in? Was it anything unusual you had to do to convince them that you were serious basketball owners in it for the long term? Well, we sat, we sat on with Paul, uh, for sure. Paul was the leader, you know, of the team and still is the leader today. We sat on with Paul's agent, and Wick and I had a meeting and said, look, there's going to be some good times and some bad times. You know, we're here to build a championship. We're going to invest in you. We're going to invest in the team. We're going to try to bring players around you so you don't have to do it yourself every night. You know, Paul was carrying this team and, and still carries the team today, uh, but, but he had to carry everything, all the water, back in the early days. And uh, I, th I think I've always appreciated the trust Paul had in us because you have many superstars demanding trades or, or wanting to get out of rebuilding situations, and we were definitely a rebuilding situation. And Paul stuck with us. We stuck with him and, and, and uh, you know, led to great results. You guys obviously win the championship in 08. The Bruins win it in 2011. Does it help both teams when both are good, or does it only matter for the Celtics if you guys are winning a championship? No, I personally think it helps all the teams in the town, include the Patriots and the Red Sox in there as well. 
when, when, when people are kind of passionate about sports, you know, they're like kids in a candy store. And, and, and so they want more and more of it. So when everybody's winning, there's, a, there's big momentum. We haven't seen any drop off, you know, when, when people are winning versus losing. And what I love about Boston is we're friendly with all the owners. We, we go way back, we're all, we're all Boston community people. We go way back for a long period of time. We knew the crafts before they even had the football team. And we work together on children's hospital, on charities, on joint efforts. And, uh, and, and, and that's a fantastic thing. A lot of towns don't have that, but we're actually close personal friends with, with each, each of the owners in town. What's been your most pleasant experience being an owner of the Celtics so far? You know, I, I think it, it, it's two, really. It, it's, it's seeing the huge community impact that it's had. Uh, you know, we knew we could do that. You, you know, you don't know if you can win a championship. There's some luck involved. There's a lot of skill, but there's a lot of luck involved. If, 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 a, if a guy blows out his knee, your star blows it, you're not going to win most times. Uh, but we knew we could impact the community. We have done that. Very, very proud about that. And then I would say in terms of moments out there, being out there uh, with my family, you know, I sit right down there uh, when we won that championship and, and seeing, seeing Doc Rivers, who had gone through a lot. You know, he, he had had a, a bad season, and then we won the championship the next year. You know, I, I hugged him at center court. My family was all around. And that, that was probably the greatest moment as a Celtic, and, and hopefully there will be more great ones to come. But certainly that was, uh, was a great memory. You mentioned the Kraft family and, and knowing them for many years. They've obviously had tremendous success with the Patriots, and uh, the family is very involved in a lot of the league committees, uh, you know, extremely intelligent and, and on the leading edge of a lot of what the NFL does. Have they ever given you advice, or did you ever seek out advice from them? And saying, we called Look, them you know, immediately after we bought the team. You know, Wick and I had known both the Krafts. So Jonathan Kraft had actually worked for Bain and Company uh, when I was there back in the early 80s. So. We were, we were friends, and they're huge people, charity in the community. We know them from the Boys and Girls Clubs. So we, we called them, and, uh, you know, we had, we, had, we had discussions, and they said, you know, you got to run this like a business. you got to invest in players. All the things I'm talking about, they gave us some fantastic advice. They're really a model, you know, for pro football, and I think for all sports franchises, a model that, that has been successful, taking the long-term view, you know, investing in the players and having a strategy that works. Steve, somebody... And Tom Brady doesn't hurt either. <laughs> yeah, right. Pretty good quarterback. Yeah. Somebody comes to this ownership group now, and given what's happened with the new TV deal the Celtics have had and, and the long-term lease that's in, in place, it says billion dollars for the Celtics. Does this group get out and sell, or do you stay on as owners? You know, I, I can only speak for myself. Uh, I, I think they're going to have to carry me out of here in a box. Uh, so so, so, so that, that's the only way, uh, you know, I, I'm going out of here. Uh, you know, I, I love this. We all did this as a labor of love. There's obviously business considerations, and, and, uh, and we have had partners like Joe Lacob has sold out and bought the Warriors. He loved it so much as well. So, so the Celtics have spawned uh, lots of other people out there in the NBA. Daryl Morey is now one of our people as general manager of the Houston Rockets. We have several coaches. Lawrence Frank is coaching. I'm, Tom Thibodeau is coaching. All our assistant coaches are, are head coaches. So we're very proud of, you know, our kind of impact on the NBA. Uh, but for me, you know, they'll have to take me out of here in a box.